Hello and welcome to the first of six videos on the American Century series of jets. I'm here at the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton, Ohio, and they've given me special access to all these different aircraft. So coming up will be videos on the F-100 we have behind me, the 101, the 102, the 104, 105, and the F-106, and I can't wait to bring them to you. But first, let's begin with the aircraft behind me, the North American F-100 Super Sabre, which was the first American aircraft to break Mach 1 at level flight. I'm Paul Stewart and I make videos about planes and a few rockets. If you're into reviews of flights from around the world and detailed tours through interesting aircraft and museums, then please check out my channel and subscribe. This was designed to replace the F-86 Sabre in the air superiority role and first flew in 1953. It entered service with the USAF the following year and was retired in 1971, where it served with the National Guard until 1979. This one here is a two-seat F-100F, introduced quickly after a large number of crashes that were initially attributed to pilot inexperience. Let's look closer at the design. Starting at the nose, we have this extremely long pole. As the air in front of the aircraft compresses, the idea was that this would affect the accuracy of the pitot tube, which measures airspeed, therefore it was moved further forward. This has a single large inlet, which was an evolution from the F-86, and we saw a similar design in early MiGs. It had the advantage of keeping the sides of the fuselage slippery, although it doesn't leave much room for the radar. And as those systems got larger and more sophisticated, they needed to use the entire nose cone for those. For comparison's sake, here is the AN-APG-59 multi-mode radar used in the F-4 Phantom II, and this is why it has such a big nose. Another problem with this design is that the air needs to be moved past the cockpit, and they do that by either moving it underneath it, like the F-86, or splitting it around the cockpit as we saw in the MiG-15. But to push the air underneath, you have to lift the whole pilot up, thus increasing the forward surface area and increasing drag. As you can see, the intake splits in the MiG-15 and moves the air around the cockpit. And finally, with this single pronounced nose-mounted intake, with high angles of attack, they could actually starve the engine of air as it would hit the underside of the lip. It's all a fascinating compromise and this is why I enjoy researching these videos so much. Moving on, we have the standard nose landing gear, so let's look at the wing. This is the next generation of swept wing designs with a sweep of 45 degrees, so it'll be interesting to compare this design with the delta wing that we'll see later in the series when I mention the F-102. While the sweep did improve high speed performance, it reduced low speed lift, hence why these lift devices here called slats were installed in the wing's leading edge. But even with those, it was not an easy aircraft to fly. In fact, they discovered early on that during high angles of attack, which is where the nose is angled upwards, instead of the air passing straight over the wing, it would move sideways, thus reducing lift and pitching the nose up. This was called the Sabre Dance and led to tragic accidents. This problem was rectified by adding this wing fence here, which, as the name suggests, works as a fence forcing the air to move over the wing and stops it from moving sideways. Moving below the wing, and we have this rocket pod. The F-100 could fire AIM-9 Sidewinder air-to-air -air missiles, AGM-12, and unguided missiles as well. Attached to a total of six hard points is also an auxiliary fuel tank that you can see here. It could also carry conventional bombs and even smaller nuclear bombs. It's a standard main landing gear extending down from the wing, and I'll talk about the interesting F-104's landing gear in that video. And between them was no internal bomb bay, as there simply wasn't room in the fuselage. Obviously storing bombs and fuel internally reduces drag and enables higher speeds, but then you need a bigger fuselage, which will then create more drag, so again it's all about compromises. Spinning around, we have the wing's trailing edge with flaps medially to improve low speed lift, and laterally we have the ailerons on display, and the rear end of the external fuel tanks. Moving back, we have one of the first stabilators, which is also known as an all-moving tailplane. This is in contrast with the traditional fixed horizontal stabilizer, which would have hinged elevators on the trailing edge moving up and down. This design generates much greater authority, thus improving maneuverability, and also reduces the need for hinges, which would add a small amount of drag. 
the slight downward camber also improves the stability with side wings. And looking up, we have a single large vertical fin. This was initially smaller, although it was enlarged by a quarter during development to reduce its tendency to yaw. Up here is a radar warning antenna informing the crew of a chasing missile, and just below that is a fuel jettison valve, which is intentionally well away from the exhaust as to avoid creating another afterburner. Now let's have a look at the engine. It's a single Pratt & Whitney J57 turbojet used in many jets including the 707 and the B52, although this one also has an afterburner. It was the first engine capable of producing more than 10,000 pounds of thrust and pushed this to a top speed of Mach 1.4. You can see the nozzle here, which is able to squeeze and open, which increases the thrust. Think of it like you're putting your finger partially over a water hose which dramatically increases the speed of the outflow allowing you to spray your siblings. This is a similar idea. Of interest, this took part in the ZLL which stands for Zero Length Launch Experiments where a Astrodyne booster rocket making 150,000 pounds of thrust would be mounted on the tail and allow it to launch from anywhere without the need of a runway. Although this never got past the testing stage. Looking extremely quickly, you'll notice a tail hook under here. This wasn't used for aircraft carriers, but rather it could be used if there was a problem with the landing and could be dropped by the pilot to drag the plane to a halt. It could cause some damage, but less than running off the runway, riding off the plane and injuring the pilot. While it did have ejector seats, they weren't strong enough to propel the pilot high enough from ground level to allow the parachute to open before they would hit the ground. Modern ejector seats, as YouTube will show you, can be safely used from ground level, therefore it was not safe for the pilot to eject from this, unless they were already well up in the air. Speaking of the crew, the standard model has a single pilot, although this is the two-seater F100F trainer model. Here is a single-seater F100D model at the same museum flown by the Thunderbirds. This extension here is an air-to-air -air refueling probe. Interestingly, several broke off during high-speed maneuvers. A little off-topic, although I recall reading how one of the many difficulties with air-to-air -air refueling during the early years was the discrepancies in speed. The motherships were big propeller planes and would fly as fast as they physically could and then the jets would have to slow down to almost their stalling speed just so that they could meet at the same speed. Hence why the KC-135 program was so important. In fact, it was originally designed as a tanker, although later it was decided to modify it into a commercial airliner, which was the successful Boeing 707. And sneaking under here, we can see the 20mm M39 cannons. This F model only had two of them, although the regular ones had four. The F100 was the first of the wild weasels, and they used these two-seat F models, as the second crew member could help with the process of identifying enemy radars and destroying them with AGM-45 Shrike anti-radiation missiles. It wasn't that successful, and that role was then given to the F105, which I'll mention again in that video. Over 2,200 were built, although it has to be recognised that 889 were destroyed in accidents, resulting in the death of 324 pilots, which really is a poor safety record. Although it still played an important role and had many successes as well. If you enjoyed the video, then please give it a thumbs up and check out my channel for many more videos. I plan to release my F101 Voodoo video about a week after this one, so keep an eye out for that. Thanks for watching.